let's see. Uh, it seems like Dustin has been here for a long time, but it's even longer than you think. He actually got his undergrad degree here in 2007, and then I think joined the, the program after that. I first started working with Dustin um, on this fun collaborative project that Dr. Todd Henry and Dustin were working on, uh, assessing the habitable zones of nearby stars. It became an important part of his thesis. You'll hear about that today. Um, and along that time, Dustin got interested in understanding, or interested in trying to understand planet formation. So it turns out lots of, many of the stars in our galaxy have planets that orbit around them, but we don't understand how they form, the gas giant planets, why many of them are so different from our solar system. So we put together this program to search for planets around stars in open clusters. And you won't hear about any of that today, because that is, didn't turn out to be part of his thesis. Um, <laughs> Because they don't exist, is what we were told. Yeah. <laughs> Turned us down, Kit Peak. I, I think I remember Justin saying he hadn't had that much rejection since he first started pursuing Brenda. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds about right. It sounds about right. Um, yeah, so anyway, about that time, then another student showed up, Sam Quinn. He had some buddies at Harvard that had their own telescope, so we thought, fine, we'll let him waste his time with this open cluster project. Um, while Justin pursues a really hard project of finding planets around the youngest stars that exist. I do mention that open cluster project, though, because that was, most people don't appreciate that Justin really did the pioneering work for that first survey, and I think was fourth author on that um, result in the publication of the first planets in open clusters. But again, it's... When, the, when he did find two planets pretty quickly. Yes, right. That weren't the there. first survey that was done. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I said, Justin has focused his work on finding or searching for planets around some of the youngest stars that exist. Um, this is involved in developing a very computationally complex method for modeling the spectra of these stars that we'll hear about today to try to measure the velocities of stars that don't want you to measure their velocity precisely using instruments for the most, in the most case, the majority of cases were not designed to achieve these precisions. So it's really impressive what he was able to accomplish. Um, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of really um, exciting results that you'll see about today. He's been a really uh, important part of our team other students that have graduated under my advisement have benefited from his knowledge and the, and the skills he helped in developing this code, so it's been fun to work with. And then one last thing I will say, um, the youngest stars he's surveyed, the ones in Taurus the Rigor, ones I actually studied as part of my dissertation work, so it was really uh, rewarding to see this survey completed, so I'm grateful that you enabled that. So I know you and your patient family have waited long enough to give this talk, so uh, just in the stage. And you're going to wait longer while I give this talk because it's, uh, it's not a short talk. I'll, I'll try to speed it along. Uh, so yeah, the title of my talk is Young Stars, Young Planets, and Habitable Zones. And uh, it is a very long-awaited um, dissertation because I've been here for a little over 10 years. Um, here's the obligatory thank you slide. There's a lot of people that have helped me along the way. Um, I'd like to special thanks to Todd. Uh, Todd picked me up as an undergraduate and then as a grad student. I worked with him on the Habitable Zone project that Russell alluded to, and he was really instrumental in uh, getting me into astronomy and um, taking me to my first telescope uh, when he sent me to the 0.9 meter down in Chile. Huge deal. Um, thanks a lot, Todd. Also, Russell, who has been uh, a great help over the years um, guiding me through this. Um, thanks to my committee members, Doug. Doug, where are you? Doug. You, Doug has been instrumental in a lot of ways in helping me through different problems that I've come across, especially in my research. Um, in fact, I'll talk about some of that later. Um, but Doug is always uh, a helpful person to go to if you have problems, especially with, with coding or with binary stars, because Doug's the binary star guy. Um, Sebastian, uh, poor Sebastian, because he's going to be our next department chair. So hats off to poor, poor Sebastian. Um, and Alex, Alex is around here somewhere. Alex, he has the poor misfortune of having the office across the hall from me. So thank you for being there. Um, I know you've probably heard some terrible things coming out of my office, uh, and I apologize for that. And everybody else who has kept me sane throughout the years, uh, thank you for all your help. So the motivation for this, big deep question, right? Are we alone in the galaxy or are we alone in the universe? I'm going to answer this question today so that we can all go home and quit, quit our jobs. It'll be all, that's, that's not true. Um, I put the Drake equation up here and some of you uh, may be familiar with, but I'm, not, I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to explain it a little bit. So the Drake equation was first formulated um, uh, when Francis Drake at the very first SETI conference, which SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They came up uh, with this idea of how would we determine the number of detectable civilizations in the galaxy, right? And they thought, well, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be a function of the star formation rate, um, how many, how quickly you form stars in the galaxy. But this is more sort of morphed into maybe the number of stars in our galaxy, um, the fraction of those with with planets. Uh, at the time, in 1961, I, they didn't really know about any planets, but we would expect them to be there. Um, or maybe perhaps not in 1961, the number of those planets um, that were habitable per solar system. And then some other things like the fraction that could develop life, uh, the fraction of those that could develop intelligent life, and the fraction that we could detect, and maybe the length of time that they would be broadcasting. Um, um, so there's sort of a temporal aspect to that uh, before they either stop broadcasting because maybe they got bored of it or they blew themselves up because they were, a, uh, they were an optimistic bunch back then. Um, so during this talk, I'm going to, uh, or actually, astronomers these days can start to answer these first three ones. Um, the average star formation rate or the number of stars in the galaxy, that's sort of um, known pretty well. We're starting to get a good idea of what the fraction of stars with planets are. And um, as I'll talk today, uh, we're starting to also get a good idea of at least the number of planets in the habitable zone. These other three, we really don't have a lot of um, evidence for just yet. Um, right? How many, uh, how many could develop life? Well, in our solar system, only one so far. Uh, there, could, there could still be some moons or, or maybe uh, holdouts for life on Mars, but, but we really don't know. And the fraction that could develop intelligent life, well, some could argue that that's either one or zero in our solar system. So depending on, uh, on, uh, on how you, you take that. What just happened? Okay. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about the um, fraction of stars with planets. So it's hard to believe for some of us uh, that are as old as I am, because I'm, I'm super old here, that uh, the first planet was found in 1989 by Dave Latham. Um, actually, it, at the time, it was considered to be a brown dwarf um, in his original paper, but later it was reclassified as a planet. So we've only been looking for planets for about 29 years. So it's a very young field. Uh, but in that time, we have found a lot of planets. Uh, this is a neat little um, histogram of the number of planets that were found per year. And you see some bumps down here. And some of these are due to the Kepler Space Telescope doing huge data releases of, hey, look at all these neat planets we found. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit about Kepler, Kepler later. But since then, we found 3,730 confirmed planets. And additionally, we have 4,496 Kepler candidates that are still waiting to be confirmed. And this given us good statistics to start um, getting an idea of how many planets there are around stars. And indeed, a paper by Mayoral in 2011 say that 50% of main sequence stars have planets. A main sequence star is a star that's sort of midway, or, or that's where it spends most of its lifetime. So it's sort of the stable version. It's not too young, and it's not old enough that it's, that it's come off the, uh, the main sequence. So speaking of finding planets, how do we find planets? I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a few of these for people in the room that, that may not know astronomy. One of them, and this is the method that I'm using here, is spectroscopy. And spectros spectroscopy is kind of the breaking up of light into its constituent colors, which we call wavelengths. This is a neat spectrum right here of the sun. And you'll notice that there's little dark bands in here. And these are due to absorption features in the atmosphere of the sun. And those are due to... Uh, different lines from um, either atoms or molecules that absorb at very specific wavelengths. And uh, we know those wavelengths uh, because we can test them here on Earth. And the neat thing about that is we can look at other stars. And something about stars that you may not know if you're not an astronomer is they're all sort of moving in the galaxy. They're moving in random directions and they're also moving in a sort of bulk motion around the um, orbiting around the center of the galaxy. And if you stare at a star um, with spectroscopy, you can figure out uh, how fast it's moving, either towards or away from us. We call that radial velocity, um, and it's something that I will talk a lot about in this. But you get sort of a, uh, since everything is moving, it's generally moving in a constant velocity unless it's being acted upon by something else. So if you look at something for a long period of time, you'll get its velocity 
towards or away from us, and it's generally constant. Unless you look for a very, very long time, and you might see that it varies a little in that constant speed. And that may be due to an unseen companion. Um, and here's a neat little animation of the Doppler effect. This is similar to what I use to determine um, radio velocities and look for planets around stars. Now, I'll note that when we take a, a, a spectrum of a star, we don't get this nice little motion as the, as the a body will tug on that star and make the radio velocity move back and forth, but we will get a snapshots. And what we can do with those snapshots is sort of build up over time um, the sort of periodicity if there is something that's moving there. So you can, you can see this motion over time if you look long enough. Another method um, that I'll talk about a little bit uh, is photometry. Photometry is sort of measuring the brightness of things. Uh, we can do it in different filters, red filters, green filters, blue filters, and you can see in this image of the Horsehead Nebula that you can see different things depending on which filter you're looking in, and that's, that's sort of important. Sometimes you can use it to de cut, uh, determine um, temperature or maybe what sort of molecules are present. But the other thing you can do if you're measuring brightness is if you stare at a patch of sky or a particular star long enough, you might see a dip in that brightness. And that's indeed what the Kepler Space Telescope did, is it stared at a patch of sky for a long, long period of time, monitored a whole bunch of stars to look for a slight dip in brightness that could be caused by a planet moving in front of the surface of that, uh, uh, in between the line of sight between us and that star. Now that's sort of a chance alignment. Um, there, is no, uh, there is no preferred configuration for, star, or for planets to, to orbit at, so it's just if we chance happen to find one that just happens to be aligned quite right. But nonetheless, Kepler found a ton of these things. And um, that's why we have so many Kepler candidates, and that's why we've, uh, Kepler has found so many stars over the years, or so many planets. So I was talking about um, when we first uh, started finding planets, turns out that the easiest ones to find, especially with the radio velocity um, method, which was sort of the first method that was being used, is that you find these big gas giant planets. And gas giants are easy because they're large and they cause the most reflex motion on their parent star as they orbit around. And I'm particularly interested in gas giants because they play a role in habitability, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. 53% of the Kepler um, confirmed planets are gas giants. But more importantly, the gas giants that I will be talking about are these interesting ones that we started finding at the very beginning, which are called hot Jupiters. 1.2% of FGK dwarfs host hot Jupiters, and a hot Jupiter is defined as anything from about 0.1 Jupiter masses and up in about a less than 10 day period. And these are kind of important in understanding um, formation and migration because they couldn't have formed there um, due to our formation uh, sort of theories and mechanisms is that they can't have formed there, so how did they get there? So that's a good question. How do uh, gas giant planets form? And the answer is we don't really know. Right, but we do have some ideas. Uh, a couple of different ideas here are this core slash pebble accretion model. Um, they, this is where the gas giants, they're gonna form past what we call the snow line. The snow line is a distance from a parent star where it's cool enough for volatiles like methane and ice crystals and whatnot to condense out, or, um, and, uh, and water ice to condense out into ice crystals. And that's important because it's pretty far away from the parent star. So um, you have a rocky core, you'll have some petals, pebbles that will start to accrete into planetesimals and then when they get enough um, gravitation, they'll start to accrete a gas, a large gas envelope. And this takes period over time as this thing orbits through the disk. This, the time of formation for this is about one to 10 million years, which sounds like a long time, but that's, that's not terribly long um, for a Jupiter mass planet. The problem with this method is it does not explain very well how you get planets at very wide separations. And it's also hard to form giant planets in cool stars. Another method is disk instability. So all these stars have disks, or these very, very young stars, they tend to have disks of gas and debris, and you'll have um, maybe an instability in that disk and it will cause a, a collapse. Um, and this happens very, very rapidly in, in thousands of years. And uh, this has been used to explain how you can get gas giant planets at very large orbital distances. We found them around 100 AU in some cases. So that's great. Here's some neat ideas of how planets might form. But how do they migrate? Um, so since they all have to form past this snow line, how do you get them really, really close into their parent star? One method 
is planet-planet scattering. Um, here is an animation of the Nice model for our solar system. It's sort of an idea of how we got um, uh, the orbital configurations we do. And here you'll see Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. You'll notice I did not say that backwards. That was Neptune and Uranus. And it's thought that possibly those two gas giant planets have swapped spots at some point. And you'll see that happen in just a minute here. And it flung a bunch of stuff in and out of the solar system in a scattering event. Now, we don't have a hot Jupiter, but this is sort of an idea of how you could get a large gas giant planet um, to be sent inwards to orbit very, very close to its parent star by scattering off of a, another object that's really large in, the solar, uh, in its solar system and, uh, and losing enough angular momentum to get in there. The other idea is this disk migration. So this is a neat simulation of a 50 Earth mass planet um, orbiting in, the, in this uh, disk. And you have these spiral density waves that you can see that are set up as this thing orbits through the disk. And this causes a drag on the planet and it loses angular momentum and it starts to migrate inwards. And that migration is halted at some point, usually by the truncation of this disk. Um, and it's actually been used to, dis to, uh, to explain why you get a pile up of planets sort of around a three day period, which is what we see. So these two methods and the two methods for planet formation, those are neat. So um, how do we test these different theories? Well, the answer of how we test these is we have to look for young planets because you can only really start to distinguish between these different models at very young ages. So that's fine. Why didn't anybody do this yet? Because the answer is because it's not easy. And why is it not easy? <laughs> yeah, some of you got it. <laughs> okay, so why is it not easy? Um, well, these young planets have, suffer from something that we call stellar jitter. Um, and stellar jitter is sort of the uh, random motion, uh, well, it's not really random. What it is, is it's caused by activity that is not due to a companion that appears to have a shift in radial velocity. And I say appears because it's not a real radial velocity shift, but it may be um, from activity on the surface of the star like spots or flares. And here's a good case study of this. HD 166435. Um, in Quelos et al. 2001, they saw this thing and they said, gee, that looks a lot like a planet. It looks like a 0.6 Jupiter mass planet in a three-day period. Um, the only sort of inkling they had that maybe this wasn't a planet was this RMS value. Um, and the RMS value is sort of the scatter in their, um, in their, uh, in their uh, residuals of this fit. Um, and they thought, well, gee, that doesn't seem right because this particular spectrograph has a has about a 10 meter per second precision. So this is almost three times that. So maybe it's something else. And they looked at it um, in, with photometry, which I talked about earlier, and they, they determined that the, the rotation period of this star was exactly the same as the period of this planet. So that seemed to be their um, idea of, hey, maybe this isn't a planet, maybe it's spots. So, a lot of these young stars have a lot of activity on the surface, like star spots, and star spots can cause an apparent shift in radial velocity. This happens because um, this cooler portion of the surface of the star, as it's rotating around the surface of the star, can distort the line profiles. So if you think about it, as, as it's uh, moving towards you, there's a blue shifted light on one limb of the star here, and if that's being blocked out by a dark spot, there'll be a distortion in that blue shifted portion of the line profile. And then as it's receding away from you, there's a distortion in the red um, shifted part of that profile. And this is important because when we look at radial velocities, we look for um, the sort of center of this line to determine what the radial velocity is. So if that line's distorted, it can appear to be a radial velocity shift, even though it's not. So how do we get by some of these problems? Well, our solution was to look in the infrared. And why do we look in the infrared? Well, stellar jitter um, is diminished in the infrared. This is a plot from Bailey et al. 2012, where they showed that uh, it, in some cases it's about two and a half times lower in the infrared. So that's important. Why is it lower in the infrared? Well, one reason is that you have a difference in um, the, that you see the stellar jitter because of a difference in the, the surface temperature versus the spot temperature. So here's what we call a black body curve. Black body curve is um, sort of the, it, it, if, if you give it a temperature, a black body curve will give you the, um, the radiation at that particular wavelength. And what you're seeing here 
is a uh, 40, about a uh, 4,500 degree um, surface with uh, about a 260 degree cooler spot. And in the, in the optical here, you can see the difference in this radiation is a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a large difference. But if you look down in the infrared out here at 2.3 microns, that's much, much lower. The spot contrast is, is much lower. So that's neat. We decided, let's give that a shot. So we embarked on this high precision infrared radio velocity search for young stars or young planets around young stars. We used Kechner spec. It has a uh, spectral resolution of about 25 to 30K. We used Gemini South Phoenix um, with a re resolution of about 50K and VLT CryRes to do that. And we utilized this 18 parameter fit using nonlinear least squared fitting, um, uh, the amoeba routine for those of you who have who've done this. Um, we use, uh, we fit for uh, three terms for the um, wavelength solution. One rate, uh, RV uh, fit, we have uh, the air mass, the instrumental profile, two normalization parameters, also the V sine I, which is the rotational velocity and some intensities. You'll notice that doesn't add up to 18. Uh, the instrumental profile is actually um, nine Gaussians that we use to model the instrumental profile. And some of you who model things with Gaussians think, well, you could, you know, you could model an elephant with enough Gaussians, right? <laughs> um, the, the, this, is, this is sort of standard for a lot of radio velocity people because line profiles tend to not be Gaussian. And so that's kind of the best way that, uh, that folks have, have found to do this. Um, we use telluric features in the atmosphere uh, to determine our, our um, wavelength solution. Cochrane et al. showed that those should probably be stable to about 10 meters per second. So that was, uh, that was what we used as our method. And if you see down here on the left-hand side, this is a short little video of, of the initial portion of our fitting routine. And this is how this works. So we have the atmospheric spectrum um, from Kitt Peak, and we have an A star, which is our uh, telluric standard, which is featureless in this wavelength regime. So if we take this atmospheric spectrum with our model spectrum, down here we'll see the red line is the convolution of these two. And the white line is our observed. So we try to fit the red line and the white line, down here is our sort of residuals, to get a first guess of what the wavelength solution looks like and the instrumental profile looks like. Then we take that and we feed that to this fitting routine, which is our target star. And these were supposed to loop, but this one has stopped. Um, so it does the same thing. Uh, it takes the, the first guesses that we got from here and it feeds it into this. And now we have this same atmospheric um, uh, spectrum here, plus a model spectrum that we get from, um, from Phoenix models. And then again, we have the convolution of these two is the red line. And then the white line is our observed. And so that's where we fit for all these other parameters like the radio velocity and the air mass and the V sine I. And these again are our residuals. And right now it, it looks like that's not doing a very good job, but um, this was actually, this has restarted to where the very beginning is. And I'll sort of note a little bit that this is uh, about the first 10 to 15 seconds of my fitting routine that generally lasts 10 to 15 minutes while it's fitting. So um, don't, don't worry too much about that. So we had our method and we decided to do a pilot study. Uh, we used the Gemini South Phoenix spectrograph and we got four nights to study 25 stars, um, all young between four and a half to 45 million years. Yes, I know for you non-astronomers that is young. Um, they're all cooler than mid K in spectral type. Um, they're two mass K magnitudes, which is brighter than five and a half. They had no known spatially resolved companions and we uh, tried to get V sine I's less than 12. You'll see that that didn't always work out, but um, that's what we shot for. And the reason for that is stellar jitter also tends to uh, scale with V sine I. So if something's rotating faster, you might have more um, activity on the surface. So we, we wanted to, to stick towards uh, slower rotating stars. And we also picked young stars, but with no evidence for active accretion on otherwise they're uh, leak, uh, weak line Titori stars. So how do we do? Well, we chose some radio velocity standards here, GJ628 and GJ752A, uh, to, to, uh, to see uh, how our precision was. Um, and here is a model, or here's the model and um, residuals and fit for GJ628, just to show this is what this looks like when it's finished. Our residuals are about 2.47%. 
So what we used um, to determine our, our empirical precision is the dispersion of our, uh, of our radio velocity standards. Um, I'm going to use this word dispersion a lot, so let me try to go over what it is. Uh, for people who are mathematically inclined, that's basically the standard deviation of all of the, all of the radio velocity measurements. For those who are, who are not mathematically inclined, what that means is, so like I said before, all stars in the galaxy are moving. So assuming they're all moving at a constant velocity, and you plotted that constantly, constant velocity, it would always have the same number, right? But what if there are sort of random errors in your measurement or random errors associated with anything else? Those, those things will lie sort of around that constant velocity. They won't be exactly the same. So the, the dispersion is sort of the deviation in that from, from a constant velocity. So it's a good sort of empirical idea, uh, precision of how good you're doing um, in your fitting. And we get 22 uh, to 31 meters per second precision which is pretty good. Now for people who do optical um, radio velocity searches for planets, they can get down to about one meters per second precision, which is about the speed of a brisk walk. We do about 22 to, 20 to 30 meters per second precision on this. Um, that's still really, really good considering this uh, spectrograph. The uh, optical folks have much higher, higher resolution. Ours, you gotta, you gotta, if you think about the resolution of this about 50K, that's about six kilometers per second um, for a line width, and which means we are measuring this to within about one two hundredth of a line width. Um, here's our results here for uh, stars that we had um, uh, enough data or more than one epoch on. Um, and we get, uh, we got the rate of velocity and we got V sine I measurements for all of these stars, which was really cool because a lot of these didn't have um, rate of velocity and V sine I measurements. But we want a little better way of determining our errors other than dispersion. So if you think about your dispersion um, being a combination of a bunch of different errors, uh, maybe your photon limited uncertainty um, and the internal error of the code, um, our fitting routine, and maybe the, uh, the instrument itself, and then this stellar jitter error that we talked about. Uh, that's, we, we take that to be the entire error of this. Well, the photon limited uncertainty we can calculate. You can calculate this. Butler et al. came up with a, uh, with a good uh, pr uh, solution for this. It's basically based on the number of lines, the, the width of those lines, and the strengths of those lines. The internal error I'll talk about in just a second here, but it appeared to depend on signal to noise. And then if you assume that the stellar jitter is zero for the radio velocity standards because they're old um, and they're not very active, uh, you can get a good idea of, of where these different errors lie. So we just need to figure out this internal error. Like I said, it appeared to, um, it appeared to scale with signal to noise. And this isn't a perfect fit, but uh, what, we've, what we saw was a difference in the radio velocity of our knotted measurements. So let, let me talk a little bit about that. How we observed these is we would take two different measurements of the same star throughout the night, um, one after another. And you do this because in the, in the infrared you want to do things like sky subtraction and whatnot. So you would take an image, or you would take a spectrum, and then you would nod to a different location on the chip, take another spectrum. And in doing this, you should get the exact same answer from one to the other because they were taken within minutes and there isn't enough time for any of these other errors to creep in. There's no stellar jitter that's associated with very, very small time scales like that. And even if there were a large companion orbiting around this, the time scales within minutes are not enough that you could get, um, you could get a large variation, yet we saw it. So that must be due to the internal error of our code. So we fit a polynomial to this and um, we're able to sort of determine what our um, internal error is. So fantastic. Now we need to figure out whether things are moving or not. So how do we do that? Well, like I mentioned earlier, dispersion is a very good first approximation. If something isn't moving, it should have a fairly low uh, dispersion. So here's a plot here of our radial velocity dispersion versus V sine I for this, um, for this sample of stars. And you can see that most of the stars lie around this sort of 63 meters per second dispersion which is pretty good. That's like, you know, one two hundredth of a line width, so, um, or one one hundredth of a line width. But then you have things that lie above this. Uh, these are sort of, these sigmas are standard deviations above this, um, above this dispersion. 
Uh, we have four stars that lie above five standard deviations. Two of them, you'll notice SZ96 and RxJ1557.8, have very large error bars. They have very low signal to noise. So we don't really consider those to be variable. The other two, TWA13A, was actually identified in uh, Bailey 2012 as being a um, candidate variable plan, uh, uh, star. So um, that's why we went after it to begin with. And the other one here, SCOPMS13. SCOPMS13 is interesting because it stands out way more than five standard deviations above that but it's also its error bars don't even go down below that. So we thought that's an interesting one to look at until we noticed that we only have three observations. But you know, sometimes you gotta go with what you got, right? So <laughs> is, there, is there any other way we could uh, sort of determine whether or not these, these uh, variations are real? Um, well, you could get more measurements, but you know, telescope time is somewhat limited and we weren't able to follow this up yet. But there's another test that um, planet hunters like to use to determine whether something is varying or not. It's called a peak chi squared test. And um, this is a little technical, but basically what it's uh, doing is determining whether or not, or how far off from the chi squared distribution something is. Um, if something has a particularly low chi squared value, or a peak p value, then it, it, there's a high confidence that it is varying. Um, if it has a very high p value, then it's probably not varying at all. So we did a peak chi-square test on this whole sample, and this is what we got. We found two stars down here with very, very low p-values, and the rest of them sort of not so much. And one of those is SCOPMS13. SCOPMS13 had a p-value of 0 .003, which um, if you, there's sort of a fudge factor for, um, for confidence, but that's sort of a 99.7% that that is, that is real variations. Uh, so that's one of our, um, one of our candidate variables, uh, and we're hoping that at some point we, we, we get some more observations of that. But you'll notice I said that there were two, and you don't see another one on this plot, and that's because the other one that's on this plot, this, the dispersion of it is probably somewhere on the ninth or 10th floor. And that's because it's a double line spectroscopic binary. Um, double line spectroscopic binary is a binary star that when you look at the spectrum, you can actually see the spectra of both stars because they're so close together that one contaminates the other. And this was actually noted in the very first uh, beginning of this observing run, and that's why there are two observations taken on this last night. Additionally, we had two more epics that were taken by a collaborator, but they were several months out and, and they didn't really fit on this plot because they would have been over here somewhere, so um, I left them off. So since these lines are sort of um, uh, blended together and my code is really designed to find planets, we decided we were gonna have to use something else. So I asked Doug, Doug, how do I do this? <laughs> and Doug said, you should use this really cool program called 2D Core, which is a two-dimensional cross-correlation program. And it takes two model spectra and it compares them to the spectrum that you're getting and it moves things around until it fits, and then it spits out what those constituent radial velocities would be for each of the components. And that's what you're seeing here in this graph here are the results from 2D core. And then we can take those radial velocities and we can put them into a big word here, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, uh, orbit fitting code that Sam Quinn gave me, because Sam is awesome. And it will fit a bunch of different orbits until it gets to the uh, a lowest chi-squared value and it gives you an answer. And this is what we got. Um, we found these to be about a 0.37 mass ratio with a period of about five and a half days. And uh, cool, we found a very young um, uh, spectroscopic binary in chameleon. So that's a neat result. Ah, good question. Good question. Um, so the, the code that we used to determine these didn't, didn't fit them simultaneously, so we actually fit them separately. And um, so there's a little discrepancy in these two. Well, that's 100 sigma, period. I, so the errors can't be right. Right, the errors are not right. Um, so the errors aren't, they're, they're, they're more based on the, the, the mode of the, uh, it's like one sigma deviation of the mode. It's, it's, it's a weird um, calculation that you get out of MP fit. So I don't, I don't know that you can take a whole bunch of stock in that, that we know that to within you know, 0.001 days. We definitely don't. 
Those are the errors in the fit, not really the error in the measurement. So we did some follow-up with uh, VLT CryRes. Uh, we looked at two stars from Phoenix and two additional stars from Beta Pick. We got eight, ep eight epics and 10 epics from the Phoenix ones and 16 epics um, on the two Beta Pick objects. Uh, we went after TWA 13A again and another, um, uh, another young star that we, we had looked at with uh, Gemini South Phoenix. Um, and we also did some radio velocity standards. Again, we, cho again, we chose GJ628. And this is the uh, plot of GJ628 and GJ752A. And how do we do on these? Well, we did about the same. Um, 32 to 63 meter per second dispersion. And we used the same method for determining our errors. So that's good. Uh, but did we find much? Um, with these other two, we did find that TWA13A was, was still a, uh, a candidate variable but we weren't able to determine what its variations were. These other two stars, though, are a coeval um, pair in beta pick that was actually first identified as a common proper motion pair by Sebastian in 2009. Um, they're about 6.3 arc seconds um, apart from each other. And additionally, in 2016, Lanier et al. showed that this one actually has, um, by using adaptive optics, we, they were able to see another companion inside here at 0.2 arc seconds, or about 11.6 AU. So we got 16 observations of this. And we ran this through our code, and lo and behold, we found another spectroscopic binary. Uh, we, used the same, um, uh, we used the same 2D core to split the components of this, and we fit this in the same way. And we had a heck of a time finding an orbit for it. And there's a reason for that. If you look at this sort of line that I have drawn here to guide your eye, there is also a long-term trend in, these, uh, in this radio velocity. So there's probably another component um, adding to this system here. So we've gone from this common proper motion pair is a, is a binary, plus, the, uh, plus the, the adaptive optics one, so it's a triple system plus the spectroscopic binary, so this is at least a quadruple system. Again, we, fit these, uh, we, fit these, we didn't fit these simultaneously, but we get um, about a 0.97 mass ratio uh, at 19.2 days, um, and uh, with sort of a, um, a trend. So, once we determined that this worked very well, we decided to do a little bit of a longer survey. And so we looked at 38 young stars, sort of northern-ish, I say, because they were, observed, they were able to be observed with um, Keckner spec. But uh, uh, upper Scorpius is pretty, it, it can be far south. Um, they, uh, they are cooler than mid-K, again. Um, same sort of selection tri criteria that we used for Gemini South Phoenix and VLT. But these are a very different, um, this is a very different data set. First of all, we had a lot of observations, uh, probably eight to, uh, to maybe 10 observations, but more importantly, over a very long time frame, sometimes up to five years uh, worth of observations over small observing runs for that uh, time period. The other uh, interesting thing about these is that the Taurus Arija um, stars are very, very young, one to two million years old. And even though 10 million years is still pretty young, these are very different uh, groups of stars. So we did the same sort of tests of how we're doing on this. Um, we tested our dispersion to see how, how well our, our empiric precision is. And uh, you see gj 628s here again, gj 752 as here again, a few other radio velocity standards that we looked at. And our dispersion, although that seems a little bit higher, um, about 75 to about 160 meters per second dispersion, um, Keckner spec has a lower resolution. It's about 25 to 50, or I mean 25 to 30 K. So we're still doing about, uh, within about one hundredth of a line width, which is pretty good. Additionally, uh, we thought we would test out this technique of, of seeing how, um, how well our orbit fitting works and, and some other things by looking at GJ876. GJ876 is nearby, it's 4.66 parsecs away, it's an M dwarf, and it's known to have four planets. Now, I want to caution that our, um, our technique is really designed to find hot Jupiters, short period, very high, uh, high reflex motion planets, and this is, um, 
a two Jupiter mass planet, but it's in a much longer period. But we thought, well, maybe it's, it's, within, our, um, it's within our detection limit, so we'll go ahead and give it a shot. And so we fed, those, uh, uh, fed our radio velocities into it, and we get an orbit. Uh, it's, it's pretty good, and um, hopefully that turned out good enough. But we fit uh, to within um, the error bars here of the period and the mass that Marcy and Del Fossi 1998 have. I will caution that we did have to fix the eccentricity in order to get this to work, um, because otherwise the chi-squared, the things like to jump off a chi-squared cliff. So uh, it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good thing that, that this can recover it, but I sort of caution that, that our, not only was our code not designed to find this, but the, the whole observing uh, run was not designed to find this. This was just a kind of a gee whiz result of could we recover this planet that we knew was already there. Additionally, we found more binaries, yay. Um, spectroscopic binaries sort of pop out at you in radio velocity surveys, and we found two more double line spectroscopic binaries. RxJ 1548.9 is an M2 in upper Scorpius. It showed 60 kilometer per second top to bottom amplitude variations. And V1096 tau is an M0 in Taurus Arija at 30 kilometers per second um, amplitude variations in the roughly 800 days that that was observed. And additionally, you can see here's an here's a example of RxJ 1548.9's fit. And the residuals are 3.5%, and you can see the secondary spectrum in our residuals. So that's how we determine, um, that's how we discovered the other ones were double line spectroscopic binaries, is because down in here with residuals, you can actually see the spectrum of the secondary. Unfortunately, um, these are sort of very sparse uh, sampling, and no matter how hard we tried, we, didn't, we couldn't get uh, a, a good um, orbit out of this that was even within a, an RMS value of 3 to 4 kilometers per second. But nonetheless, these are two very young uh, double-line spectroscopic binaries, so new double-line spectroscopic binaries, and, and that's a pretty neat result. So looking for uh, variables in our Kechner spec sample. We did, something, we did the same thing that we did for the other two samples, is we looked for dispersion as a function of V sine i. And torus are these, these black squares here, and upper Scorpius are the, are the black circles. And I've also have, this, have a histogram over here to show the same thing. The white boxes are Taurus Arija, and the crosshast box, boxes are upper Scorpius. And right off the bat, you see that there is a difference, a big difference in these two populations, right? The Taurus Arija objects are sort of spread out all over the place, and the upper Scorpius objects are sort of clustered around this 200 meter per second dispersion value. And that's, that's important. We noticed that right off the bat. So we thought of, well, what's a better way of, or maybe just another way of determining um, this sort of uh, variation? And so we came up with a, a term that we called delta. We think of delta as if, you're, if your dispersion is high, but your error is high, and you divide the two, you'll get a lower number. So if your dispersion is high and your error is really low, you'll get a larger number, and these things will stay high above um, in this delta value. So we did this for both of these samples, and again, we got a large spread in Taurus Arija objects, and we got sort of this clustering down here of, uh, of upper Scorpius objects. We also did a chi squared test on these, uh, these two uh, populations, and upper Scorpius is sort of consistent with a non-varying um, population of stars with sort of a spread of chi squared values. Where Taurus Arija, 16 out of the 24 stars showed real intrinsic variation. And that's important because it, it shows that these are indeed varying. Um, whether that's real variation or variation due to a companion, that's difficult to tell because they can't all have statistically planets. So um, that's something I'll talk a little bit about later, but it's something to keep in mind. On the other hand, we'll notice that there are two stars down here. That, uh, that are in upper Scorpius that have very low p-values. One of them I already talked about. It's the, uh, it's the double line spectroscopic binary. And the other one, you'll notice, is one of upper, upper Scorpius object that is sort of way above and different than all these other grouped upper Scorpius objects. And indeed, it has a p-value of 10, or 2.2 times 10 to the minus 25. So, we decided to see what that might be doing and what's interesting about this star. 
So we did a Simbad search to see how many references it has and who else has looked at this star, and apparently nobody else in the world thought it was very interesting because it has three references in all of Simbad. But it did show high, sort of hundreds of meters per second uh, variations on very short time scales. Um, I'll note that the average dispersion for upper Scorp Scorpius is 161 meters per second. And uh, so this, this was sort of real dispersion. Um, and we thought, well, gee, let's take these radio velocities. Let's fit them through the same orbit fitting routine that we did before. And we get a result, um, which is a 5.35 Jupiter mass planet at 10.67 days. That's super cool, right? Uh, first uh, candidate planet at 10 million years. But then you say, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Look at, the, like, not, not a single one of these uh, dots uh, touch this line. Well, a few of them do, right? That one does, that one, that one, that one. There's a, there's a large spread here. But I'll sort of uh, caution that in that Sure, but our, our dispersion, our sort of average dispersion for upper Scorpius is 161 meters per second. Um, and that's probably along the lines of what the stellar jitter is for this particular star. So it's, pretty neat, uh, it's a pretty neat find. Um, in fact, we are currently following this up with um, SMART's data. Uh, and so we really want to figure out uh, what's, what's, what's really going on with this. But it's a very neat result. So we had these two neat pop or very different populations. The uh, Taurus Origa population at 1 to 2 million years, and this upper Scorpius population at 10 million years. And I noted the spread that we saw earlier in the dispersion. Now, earlier when I was talking about our, our error treatment, how we did sort of treated the error, I talked about the dispersion being a function of the internal error and the um, stellar jitter and this photon and limited uncertainty. And so if you sort of rearrange these terms, right, you have the dispersion minus this is the combination of that photon limited uncertainty and the internal error. You're going to get your stellar jitter out of that. And so this is a plot of stellar jitter versus V sine i for upper Scorpius, Taurus Origa, and then we added in TWA and beta pick from Bailey et al. 2012. And we did that because Bailey uh, used the same instrument and a very similar technique. In fact, John Bailey wrote uh, the very early version of the code that I used that I've since modified heavily. So we thought these would be a very good, um, these would be a very good uh, sample to use and, and compare to what we had had. And the result from this is that stellar jitter appears to decrease significantly in the first 10 million years. But then more slowly afterwards, um, we have this very large stellar jitter at 1 to 2 million years, but then at 10 million, they all seem to be clustered around, you know, below 200 meters per second. And then at the 24 million year old beta picks, they still don't seem to change all that much. So that's very, uh, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know that that's been shown. But the idea of searching for planets around young stars is that we knew that there was going to be stellar jitter. And so we knew that, that this, this stuff was going to exist, and, uh, and, and we may still need to account for it. So we looked at a very young star the, uh, as a case study here, C to 3. C to 3 uh, is an M2 in Taurus Origa. It had high dispersion, 556 meters per second dispersion. It had a very high delta value and a very low uh, P value. And it had full amplitude variations of 751 meters per second over the seven observations in very short time scales. So we did the same thing that we did with our other candidate planet. We fit this through an orbit fitting routine. And would you look at that? That is uh, an awesome fit, isn't it? In fact, the RMS for, for this is zero meters per second. It is a perfect fit. If anybody believes that, I have some oceanfront property <laughs> in DeKalb County I'd like to sell you. We have to remember that the, the mean stellar jitter for Taurus Origa is 293 meters per second. So we really can't do much better than that. Additionally, our, our best precision with this technique on radio velocity standards is 75 to 150 meters per second. So we really can't do better than that. So this is sort of implies that our code is, is really overfitting the data. Um, stellar jitter can uh, cause uh, RV, an RV curve to look eccentric. So we're probably seeing um, stellar jitter here on these very, very young Taurus Origa objects. Uh, I, I just wanted to show that um, there is another uh, star that has been purported to be in Taurus Origa. It's CI Tau. It's an uh, uh, 8.8 .8 Jupiter mass planet in a 
in about a nine day period. It also has a very high eccentricity, which sort of raises some red flags. And the RMS that they quote is 700 meters per second RMS, which is uh, all, more than twice what the uh, stellar jitter is for Taurus or Ija. So take that uh, what you will. Nevertheless, what we decided to do was um, instead of the best fit here, which was a, five point, uh, a 0.557 eccentricity, we fixed the eccentricity to a bunch of different values to see uh, how that changed our RMS. Uh, 0.45, 0.35, 0.25, and 0. And you see that we actually get close to the stellar jitter, uh, mean stellar jitter of Taurus or Rija at these sort of 0.25, somewhere between 0.25 and 0 eccentricity if we fix that. That being said, um, it's really difficult to determine the, the uh, cause of these sort of variations in Taurus or Aja, simply because it has such high stellar jitter. And you're definitely going to need um, more than one observation or more than one type of observations to really get to the bottom of, what, of, of these variations and why they're, they're shifting. So we really didn't consider this to be a candid variable. It's probably, uh, it's probably stellar jitter, but it was a neat um, case study of, of looking at, at stellar jitter. So for the keck nurspec sample, we were actually able to uh, determine our detection rates because it was, a longer, it was observed over a longer period of time. Here I'm showing um, detection rates for three, 10, and 30 day periods. Uh, we used another fancy Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation to determine our detection limits. What this did was it took a million planets at every single mass bin here, and it varied randomly the, the orientation and the eccentricity to see if we could detect it given our, given our errors to a 95% confidence. And this histogram showing the number of stars which we could detect a planet at a particular mass bin in three day periods. And uh, for our Keck NERSPEC sample, we do, pretty, uh, we do pretty well. I think above, um, we get to our full sample at about 30 to 35 um, Jupiter masses. Same with 10 days, at, uh, a 10 day period at about 65 to 75 Jupiter masses. We don't do um, quite as well at 30 days, but uh, we, we really weren't designed to go out that far anyways. But we, we thought we would show that. So I've talked a lot about young planets and, and young uh, uh, looking for these hot Jupiters. So why are we so interested in these hot Jupiters? Well, if we, like I alluded to before, if we can understand how hot Jupiters form and, and we can find them at very young ages, we can start to constrain uh, giant uh, theories about giant planets. And this is important because giant planets may be necessary to habitability. They clear the inner solar system of leftover debris and planetesimal, planetesimals. And uh, without this large gravitational body shepherding objects, you could have a lot of sterilizing events over time. So back to the Drake equation. Next I'm going to shift gears and we're going to work on this um, number of habitable planets per solar system idea. Um, and in that we need to know what is a habitable zone. Well, a habitable zone is defined as the distance from a star where you'd find liquid water on the surface of a planet. Uh, this is a neat graphic that shows sort of different types of stars and where their habitable zones would lie. And in mathematical form, the temperature of the planet's surface is a function of this effective temperature of the star, the radius of the star divided by two times the distance to the planet, all to the one half, and this one minus albedo, which is a reflectance um, factor. Uh, we use 0.3 for Earth, all to the one fourth. But this is sort of assuming, um, this, this doesn't really take into account atmospheric uh, effects. And running, uh, Running uh, atmospheric models and, uh, and climate models is very, very uh, cumbersome and difficult. So we needed uh, a way to do this empirically. And so we use this notion based on Celsius et al. 2007 called the early Venus and Earth criterion. And this is based on the thought that Venus had or hasn't had water in about a billion years and Mars had water about four billion years ago. So if we adjust for the solar radiation at those times, we could determine this uh, planet temperature at the distance of those star, or di distance of those planets given that. And then we can rearrange the terms and we can figure out what these inner and outer radius is based on, uh, which is still a function of 
the effective temperature and the radius, but now we've got temperatures to work with. So we need these, uh, in order to determine these, we need these uh, radius and effective temperatures. But first we need a sample. And what can we look at? Well, sort of the best sample here would be to work uh, on the sample that the Recons group has spent so much time curating, the five parsec sample. And the reason it's so good is because it's volume limited out to M, um, which is very important because it can give you very good statistics on which types of stars um, have the best habitable real estate. And I'll talk about that term later. Um, so there are 67 stars in 50 systems. We have 1A, 1F, 3G, 7K, 50M stars, and some white dwarfs in there. Um, additionally, we extended this out to 10 parsecs for AFGK stars, and that's because we know that Hipparchos was not complete out to M, so we sort of estimated the number of Ms to be, you know, um, 400 from this uh, 50, so you've doubled the distance, so you cube that number, or you cube the distance and, and multiply it by that. Uh, then we collected the photometry and parallax, which is distance, um, binary properties, planet properties, uh, stellar radii and temperatures where available from the literature values. But we still need something. We still need the radius and the temperature. Um, so I'm going to throw some equations up here. I don't like to normally do equations, but I promise this will be somewhat painless. Um, but I need to tell you why we did what we did. So. The luminosity of a star, sort of the total brightness of the star, is a function of 4 pi times the radius of the star, times the sigma, which is just a constant, um, times the effective temperature of the star to the fourth power. But we can't observe luminosity. Um, what we can observe is flux. And flux is a measure of the luminosity and the distance to that object. And like I said, we already know the distance, right? We got the parallax for these things. So if we divide these two, all right, we still need to know the radius, and we still need to know the temperature. We have the distance, but now we have an observable quantity that we can, we can measure, the flux. So you can measure the flux by different ways. You can take a spectrum of the star, or you can do photometry. Photometry measures brightnesses of things, right? But um, number one, spectra is kind of difficult to get, and we, we have a lot of stars in our samples, so that would take a lot of telescope time. And photometry is pretty relatively or rel, uh, pretty readily available. So that's what we decided to do. We used photometry, and for this, we took um, model spectra of the star from Peter Hauschild, um, 1999, Phoenix models, and we, what we ran these through is UBVRIJHK filter response curves. And you can essentially do um, synthetics photometry. So when you, when you run these through these, these filter responses, you'll get a single point at each of these filters that tells you how much light there would be underneath that at a particular stellar temperature. And then you can multiply that by a radius. And you can vary those uh, radii and temperatures. And so that's what I did. I wrote a chi-squared fitting routine that would compare um, synthetic UBVRJHK photometry with uh, observed values. And so here's a couple of plots. This is Sirius A, and this is Procyon, which is a near subdwarf. Um, and the model here is the asterisk, and the diamonds is our, 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 our observed values. And so this is a couple of uh, uh, stars that we did, but you know, how did we do? Well, there are some um, radius and effective temperature measurements out there from Chara, from VLTI, from PTI, where these are large interferometry. That's a big word, but they basically measure very precisely small things. To within a few percent, they can get the, uh, the errors of these, these radius and temperature. So we compared the values we got from our fitting routine to those from uh, large interferometers. On average, we were about 7% smaller, and we were about 2% hotter. That's roughly the same luminosity. So we did all right. And we use these radius and temperatures, now that we have them, to determine the inner and outer radius of that habitable zone, or the widths, which were calculated for each star. But as you can see, some of these widths are quite large. And so maybe the width of the habitable zone is not the best measure of the total available um, habitable area. So we chose something that we call habitable real estate, which is the um, whole area of this annulus around a star that has 
uh, habitable zone. And that's because sometimes you can have stars or you can have planets in different um, configurations that may be able to occupy that same space. So we chose to do that for every star in our sample. Um, a little bookkeeping here, the multiples were counted as single stars unless the, the uh, secondary was um, deemed to be disruptive, which would mean it would be so close to the other star that you wouldn't able to dynamically have a planet in the habitable zone. We removed white dwarfs, brown dwarfs, and giants from our um, habitable zone calculations because uh, they're sort of cooling on long time scales and can't uh, support habitability over very, very long giga year time scales. Down here, I'm showing a graphic that I made of Sirius A, Alpha Cent A and B, and Proxima Centauri. These are actually the closest star system to us. It's a triple system. And as you can see, Sirius A has a very, very large um, habitable zone. It's an A-type star, um, and so it has this really, really large habitable zone. Um, Alpha Cent A is a G-type star that's a little hotter than the sun. Alpha Cent B is a K-type star that's a little cooler than the sun. And then Proxima, if, if you can I see that, that's an M-type star. And it has a little, little tiny habitable zone. So we're starting to get an idea of what, uh, what are good habitable zones, or what are good stars that, that could hold habitable planets um, by looking at this graphic, right? Another neat, uh, another neat thing you can get out of this, um, like I had mentioned, we used photometry to fit radial, radius and temperature. So uh, we were able to get habitable zones from, from photometry. So what could we use to maybe um, get a down and dirty idea of what the habitable zone of a star is that we happen to be looking at. Well, we can use Todd's favorite color. I'm going to use um, uh, B minus K here, which is Todd's favorite color, to determine the inner and outer radius of a habitable zone. Um, these are neat little, uh, this is a plot here of the, of the habitable zone versus V minus K for different spectral type stars. And we fit that to a polynomial and we have this neat little relationship here. And so this allows people to get the habitable zone of any star that they're looking at to within um, uh, a small error and also allows us to extrapolate this to larger populations. So let's get back to the idea of, oops. Which stars have the most habitable real estate? Like I mentioned before, you know, A, A stars have a lot of habitable real estate. So do F, G, F and G stars. They have individually a lot of habitable real estate. But on mass, if you notice, the M stars have, a, have more habitable real estate than all of the stars pretty much combined. The M stars, um, I actually had to split this into another graph, so the M stars come, come all the way up here. And that's because M stars make up 84% of all stars within 10 parsecs. And on mass, they account for 36.5% of all the habitable real estate in the 10 parsec sample. So even though individually they have very, very small habitable zones, on mass, they have quite a bit of habitable real estate available. Um, here's the values for AFGK stars. Additionally, why these are so interesting, not only that they are very numerous, but Kepler's statistics have shown that for uh, stars with effective temperatures less than 4,000 Kelvin, so sort of this, this M regime here, the Earth-sized planet occurrence rate for planets in the habitable zone is about 4%. So if you take the number of star M stars we have uh, within 10 parsecs, that means that we should be able to find 16 Earth-like planets in the habitable zone within 10 parsecs. So that's a very, very neat result here. So this brings us sort of around to, to, the, to the question here. Um, like I alluded to before, we could start to answer some of these, these questions or these, these terms here. The average star formation rate, which I said is probably a better described as the number of stars in the galaxy. It's sort of ballpark, two to four million, so let's split the difference, or a billion, let's call it, cause it three, 300 billion stars. Um, and I said 84% of those are M stars, right? So there's 252 billion M stars. Half of main sequence stars have um, planets around them, so 262 billion M stars have planets around them. And the, the, uh, the occurrence rate for, um, for, M, for habitable, or I'm sorry, for Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone for M stars was 4%. So that means in the galaxy there should be about 5 billion Earth-like planets in the habitable zone in the galaxy. That's a neat result. Um, additionally, we still don't know the answer to these, but let's sort of turn it on, the, on its head and think to ourselves, well, 
you know, what if, what if there was a planet out there orbiting an Earth-like, uh, or orbiting a, an M star? Would they be able to detect us? Well, we've been broadcasting for about 100 years. That's a little over 30 parts, it's actually closer to 31. We're going to round it down because I don't like to have ones in there. Um, so 30 parsecs, that gives us, using our estimate, about 10,800 M stars. That means there's about 432 Earth-like planets in the habitable zone within um, 100 years of broadcasting range. So take that, uh, take that with what you will. We finally made it to the end. <laughs> you guys can go soon, I promise. Um, we found that uh, searching for young planets is, is incredibly hard. Um, there are ways around it. Uh, we used infrared, um, but uh, a, a big reason for this is stellar jitter. And, uh, and, and infrared is, doesn't get you all the way around stellar jitter. There's still other things that you have to do. Um, Follow-up observations, maybe taking simultaneously multi-wavelength observations, um, or doing uh, photometry to determine rotation periods. Uh, we did f determine RV measurements for 60 young stars and V sine A measurements for 50 or 60 young stars, some of which did not previously have measurements, which is a super cool result. Also, four new double-line spectroscopic binaries, including one that's uh, one to two million years old, and a candidate planet at 10 uh, million years. Um, I'm super excited about this, and, and I hope that those, uh, those new measurements we're getting uh, pan out soon. Um, additionally, we looked at sort of the difference uh, in stellar jitter for very, very young stars, the one, one to two million years Taurus Origa and the 10 million year old upper Scorpius objects. We see that those are very, very different and that there must be a, a large decrease in stellar jitter in that first sort of uh, 10 million years. And we found that hab, uh, M stars are really, really good uh, uh, targets for, for habitable zones and, and there may be uh, even 16 Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone within uh, 10 parsecs. And that's it. <laughs> Clear as mud, right? Any questions? Misty! A lot of those came from um, Krauss and Hillebrand and, and a few others, but they, they usually, those are all sort of models for, for the stellar ages. Um, the, the single stars or any no, these are all in sort of moving groups and, and young clusters. So it's like an HR diagram fit or something like that? Yeah, I believe so. Dick? Planet around a main sequence star. <laughs> okay. I was thinking that Peter Vandekamp was actually the first person that identified a planet. But this was around Barnum Star. And I know that there was a lot of questions about systematics, about the observations that he had. Last I heard, that the argument was going back and forth whether or not there was real evidence there for a planet. Yeah, that's, that's why I, I quoted this. In fact, um, sometimes you, when you look for that answer, you actually don't find um, Dave Latham. You find 1992 was the first planet um, found. But I think it's largely accepted that that, that uh, planet that was found by Dave Latham back in 1989 right now is probably one of the earliest. I think you could, you could probably make arguments for some other ones, but um, I think that's the one that was why. And, and if you look at the, Dave, the, the paper that Dave Latham um, published back then, they say, you know, this could be a, 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 a planet, but um, they, they sort of largely settled on the fact that it was probably a brown dwarf given its M sine I, and they didn't know the inclination. It was, was kind of high on the, on the mass range. But Todd wants to say something. I know you do. <laughs> I can see the look on your face. Second is Alex Volstan, which is around the pulsar. 
the third is Michelle Mayor in 95. So those three dates are 89, 92, and 95. Depending on which way you want to define it, pick one. I decided to use the 89 so that I didn't, I didn't take too much grief. 